Thinking Aloud, conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we're going to explore the philosophical concept of mind at large. My guest is philosopher Michael Grosso. We've done two previous interviews on the new Thinking Aloud channel with Michael and even on the original Thinking Aloud uh, channel. Uh, he's a specialist in religious miracles, amongst other subjects. We've also done an interview on his book, The Man Who Could Fly, St. Joseph of Copertino and the Mystery of Levitation. Uh, some of his other books include The Final Choice, Death or Transcendence, Frontiers of the Soul, Smiles of the Universe, Experiencing the Next World Now, Soul Making, Uncommon Paths to Self-Understanding, and he's also a co-author of Irreducible Mind toward a psychology for the 21st century. This is an internet interview, and I'll switch over now. Welcome, Michael. It's a pleasure once again to be with you. It's a pleasure from my angle, too. Thank you. So, we're going to discuss mind at large, basically as a philosophical concept. It's sort of your way and the way of many other thinkers to, to begin to address all of these anomalous phenomena uh, we've all been exploring for decades. But I think for benefit of our viewers, we should define what you in particular mean by that phrase, mind at large. Well, as you know, it's a phrase that comes from Aldous Huxley. I borrowed it from Huxley. Uh, and when he was talking about his, uh, mescaline experiences. Uh, but the way I'm using it, uh, not inconsistent at all, uh, with, I think, others, but I'm basing my notion of an enlarged or a, lo a great mind on empirical data. For example, telepathy. By virtue of telepathy, we can assume that at least in principle or hypothetically, uh, we're all at some level mentally connected. Clairvoyance, ditto. We, the potential is there to perceive beyond the limits of our sensory life. So it seems entirely plausible, given all these phenomena, to postulate a mind that transcends the personal mind. It's not utterly different because our individual minds are rooted uh, in the greater mind. And that's what enables us, uh, at least in theory, to communicate with each other and to communicate with other uh, mental uh, agents or entities or beings that may inhabit this greater, wider uh, mind at large. That is, again, not a fanciful speculation. It's based on all kinds of uh, phenomena that uh, we have been looking at for, for, for many years. So that's the rough idea that there's an extended, that we are immersed in an extended mind that we can interact with in possibly very interesting ways. And uh, so that, that's pretty much the sense of what I mean by mind at large. With regard to telepathy, for example, the implication is that all minds, at least all human minds, are somehow part of this one mind at large. Exactly. And, and uh, this is not something we can prove in any simple manner. It, it is a speculative hypothesis based upon uh, all the different kinds of paranormal experiences that we have that suggest this extended powers of consciousness that we all possess. And it seems to me that if one human being has it in principle, we can assign that as a potential to all. It's an idea, of course, that mystics uh, in almost every culture have uh, stated. Well, absolutely. I mean, there are, uh, as I said, beside the purely paranormal uh, phenomena that interest us, there are the mystical experiences where the there is a, it seems by virtue of the reports we hear that uh the individuals have impressions vivid experiences of that of that greater mind 
And it, it's quite a transformative and powerful experience. So between the mystical phenomena and the paranormal phenomena, I think it, it's a perfectly reasonable thing to hypothesize this notion of a greater mind. And I like to be uh, minimal in my terminology. That's why I'm happy with the greater mind. Uh, we don't know how greater. We don't know the origins of it. We're facing mystery. But it's not mystery that we're dreaming up. It's mystery based on empirical encounters with reality. Well, Bishop Barclay, a great philosopher, a British empiricist, postulated that we everything exists in the mind of God. And I, under the impression from your writing that you, you're you not going that far. You're not claiming that mind at large is the same thing as God. No, I, I think that would be going beyond the empirical. I, but it's a, again, it, it, I, I consider it a plausible and reasonable hypothesis, especially for people who are religious believers. I happen not to have any particular attachment to any particular religious faith. Rather, I think what I have come up with my own experience and my own analysis is an idea that allows me to uh, assume that there is a background, a fundamental reality that all religions are responding to in different ways and in their different historical and cultural contexts. So uh, it, it, some individuals who are religious might be a little uncomfortable with that de democratization of, the, of God and the spirit. Uh, I'm not. I think that's the direction we need to move. We can we can retain belief in our particular religions. I was born Catholic, so I have a special feeling for my Catholic tradition, but I don't regard it as the only doorway to truth. I see that other other religions, other peoples, other cultures have worked out their own ways of connecting. And if we think of this ecumenical spirit, which has been around for some time in the modern world, I think that's the way to go toward uh, uh, the affirmation of the spiritual without risking the dogmatic, the dangers of lapsing into divisive dogmatism. Yeah, because most uh, contemporary theological traditions, certainly not all, would ascribe to God certain characteristics like omnipotence and omniscience. Uh, and, and I gather that you, you would say we don't yet have that kind of empirical data with regard to mind at large. Absolutely. On the other hand, I'm equally willing to admit that we don't know the limits of what can be done. Uh, there have been moments uh, in reading the history of miracles, for example, I'm fascinated by the Old Testament, some really spectacular miracles uh, are reported. And I sometimes, uh, you know, at this stage of my mental evolution, I'm beginning to wonder if indeed some of those fantastic events may have been real paranormal uh, effects the result of, uh, of, a, of a group of people very intense about their beliefs, uh, very intense about their crisis as a people, uh, I don't, I'm not willing to rule out even the most fantastic claims, but I don't adhere to them. Uh, I merely pose them as possibilities. The real paradox to me is that uh, certainly throughout most of my life, and I think most people would agree, we don't identify ourselves as being part of this larger mind. We think of ourselves as as being mortal beings who who have a birth and a death and and all sorts of daily concerns. That's what our mind seems to mostly relate to. Well, that's true, and it's almost inevitable uh, prior to any great experience or meditation or re self-reflection where finite bodies struggling in a, in a dangerous environment to survive, and our consciousness is pretty much riveted on the needs of our bodies and survival in a, in a, in a difficult, dangerous world. But throughout history, as we all know, there have been individuals, either accidentally or on the basis of some deliberate tradition, uh, that claim to have broken through to a larger consciousness. And uh, so the fact that the common sense doesn't allow it uh, in ordinary life seems to 
uh, negate such an idea or, or not be consistent with such an idea is not at all a compelling argument, in my, in my view, against it. You know, I've done many interviews with the philosopher uh, Bernardo Castrop, who addresses th this question, and he refers to a kind of membrane. I guess you'd have to call it a, a mental membrane that surrounds us and and separates us from awareness of this mind at large. Do you do you subscribe to that notion? Well, I would say the membrane is our own personal brain which forces us in the normal circumstances only to process local events, local impressions, local motor acts. But it's in the extraordinary cases where that seems to break down and, and uh, the, 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 the wider view uh, of Bernardo then uh, m begins to make more sense. Uh, so I, I'm, you know, very impressed by Bernardo's speculations. I am I'm wondering how, how interested he is, however, in the paranormal. I don't see that much. Uh, I think he would strengthen his arguments if he brought them in. I don't think he's against it, but he just hasn't deployed that realm of data. Uh, and uh, I, next time I see him, I'm going to make that suggestion. <laughs> I haven't seen him in a while. Yeah, I think his his attitude is that he he can uh, get to the the end result he's seeking strictly through a logical argument without having to employ empirical data. At least in the paranormal, because it's so controversial. I think he does uh, talk more about data from psychedelic drug research. Well, I'm with him on that. But as far as the uh, of trying to avoid the conflicts associated with the paranormal, I have a different uh, attitude. My deliberate purpose in writing the book on miracles was to pick out the most provocative phenomena to enhance the challenge, make it harder, make it more interesting, make the discussion more fundamental. And so I'm not in the least concerned about uh, offending uh, or moving too quickly, uh, I would say, toward a, uh, a full-blown, empirically grounded, enlarged vision of the human mind. But that, that's a matter of personal style and uh, lifestyle. Maybe he's worried about a job. I'm not. I've retired, so I don't care. I've got nothing to lose. <laughs> You've mentioned telepathy as a starting point, uh, suggesting that uh, all, may perhaps even all sentient beings, all conscious beings, are part of this one mind. That kind of makes sense, uh, that consciousness would be connected everywhere. But when we talk about clairvoyance, uh, that suggests that uh, this mind at large connects our minds not only with each other, but with the external uh, non-conscious world. Well, it does, in fact, seem there is good, solid, independent evidence for the reality of clairvoyance. And uh, so, therefore, uh, we, I think we're obliged to include that, just as we're obliged to include some of the temporal oddities of consciousness, precognition and retrocognition. Uh, if you keep questioning me, I'll probably come up and say something like this. If you push the data as far as you speculatively can, what we're doing in effect, or what I'm doing in effect, is providing a kind of empirical reconstruction of the concept, the traditional concept of, of, of God as being all-powerful and all-knowing. Uh, that's what I learned in, in kindergarten, not in kindergarten, in Sunday school. Uh, but uh, I, I've had to uh, find my own way back to such a big idea, largely by through my own experience and through searching uh, the vast varieties of human experience across the whole breadth of history. And it begins to, the idea of such a deity with such extended powers begins to make more sense to me, but I'm not ready to make the leap of faith uh, or the leap of logic <laughs> uh, to the ultimate. Uh, I think I've gone far enough uh, to be provocative enough <laughs> and to provoke myself. 
Well, you have done extensive explorations in uh, one of the most dramatic cases in history, the case of uh, St. Joseph of Copertino. We've done a previous interview about it. I'm going to link to that interview now. If people check the upper right-hand corner of their screen will be a link to, uh, you call him the Flying Friar. <laughs> and, right. Uh, it was a wonderful interview, but uh, because it's such an extreme case, I think it, it's a good one to discuss because it seems to suggest that, uh, amongst other things, mind at large can uh, lift people up in the air so that they can practically fly. Well, in the case of Joseph, uh, he, he he flew, uh, and uh, I. I Again, that that part uh, is very difficult to to entertain. Uh, on the other hand, uh, my view is that the psychokinetic factor of mind at large is ingrained in the very nature of consciousness, and uh, it's ingrained in our ordinary everyday consciousness because uh, when we move our bodies around and decide to point at the moon or get up and go for a run or something, our minds are making decisions and are guiding uh, and uh, compelling our bodies sometimes to do things that our bodies would never do if left to, to, to their own devices. So we already have evidence of the power of the mind to shape the body and, and in many, the individual body in many ways. So if mind is larger than my individual mind, then I'm, I think it's plausible to speculate that correspondingly larger psychokinetic phenomena are, are possible. And one case that comes to mind is the case that you write about in your book, in PK Man. There's pretty far out stuff that you report there. And as you know, I read that book very carefully. And uh, you convinced me that this uh, totally incredible personality is for real. And so the phenomenon we're talking about, if you look around here and now, things are going on right now that suggest these big, uh, shockingly strange uh, phenomena taking place. You brought up the question of how we can move our own bodies. I can decide to move my body at will without any difficulty. That, and you're, you're saying that might well be psychokinesis. Well, I think they some have already used the phrase endosomatic PK versus exosomatic PK. When you think about levitation, uh, the, uh, the, uh, in, in contrast, let's say, to healing, in healing, there's an, an exosomatic PK effect. The influence is going outside of my body and affecting another body. But in the case of levitation, the levitator usually uh, is ecstatic, not all the time, but usually ecstatic, in a very special state of mind. And then his whole body loses mass, the only way you can describe it, uh, and, and floats up uh, and uh, it seems to free itself from the constraints of gravity. Uh, so... You know, again, uh, there's those are facts that have been observed, and uh, we have to explain them somehow. Uh, and it does seem to me that um, the we're approaching the more we look into these phenomena and accept them as real, the more we have to enlarge our concept of the causal efficacy or powers of the human mind. It doesn't make me uneasy. <laughs> some, some people, I think, I, are definitely made uncomfortable by thinking about these things. Well, I really enjoy that distinction you made between endosomatic psychokinesis and exosomatic. Uh, it, it, to explore that a little further, endosomatic psychokinesis would be ego-based. I mean, I decide my small self makes a decision. I'm going to raise my hand like like that. But uh, for the most part, uh, certainly in these ecstatic levitators, the uh, source of the psychokinesis would not be the ego. Well, that's true. But, but the ego in that case, I would say, is hooked up with a bigger ego, a more powerful ego. Uh, and, and that explains uh, the difference in the large-scale effect versus the small-scale effects that 
are part of our everyday struggle to survive. Uh, you know, I, I just also like to mention here, it's a theme by itself, but, uh, you know, it, when one is, why do we have psychic abilities in the first place? And it does seem to me that we don't have them specifically to survive in this world because we have sensory and rational faculties that enable us to do that. So I've often wondered if the reason that we do have psychic abilities, they are, and they are latent potentials that will come into full bloom and use after we drop our bodies in death and, and our minds are all that we possess. And our minds then will become the, the creative basis of a post posthumous form of existence. But that's a topic for another discussion. I couldn't resist saying it. It's, it does seem to be related because uh, uh, mind at large could very well be where we are embedded after the physical body is, they sometimes say, drops away. Something is still left. Yes, that's my, my view. And, and it, it's perfectly uh, logically conceivable to me. Uh, you know, we're so used to uh, being embodied creatures and being dominated by the body that we, it's natural to assume that's the primary reality. But maybe that's a big mistake and that we are embedded, as you say, nicely in a much larger, greater mental and spiritual reality. Well, it raises so many questions. Uh, for example, uh, why can't I leave my body at will? Some people seem to be able to do that, and other people don't seem to have that skill. What's the difference? <laughs> right. Well, I, it, I think in part it's habit. I, I have a feeling, again, I, I, these are experiments that could be performed. If we could teach people to expect the impossible more readily, they could do it. But partly habits, partly the nature of our physiology, uh, I mean, there are forces involved and they need to be deployed and activated. And I would simply say that ordinary everyday life where our minds are scattered, our attention is fragmented, we are immersed in our bodily needs and, and habits, we're just not, uh, we're not poised, we're not ready for it. Just as we're not ready to write a great uh, musical composition at any moment of the day, even if we happen to be geniuses, right? Uh, I mean, you, you can't go up to Michelangelo and say, paint a masterpiece by three o'clock. Uh, it doesn't work that way. The, the extraordinary phenomena that human beings possess are parts of delicate mechanisms that needs, need to be teased carefully and thoughtfully or, as the case may be, sometimes spontaneously and accidentally into full activity. So that part doesn't bother me. In fact, I'd be uh, upset if everyone could just levitate all over the place all the time. <laughs> be a freaky world to live in. <laughs> One wonders, though, if, uh, you know, on another planet in a different culture, if that's not within the realm of human possibility. It seems to me that uh, if you take, for example, the sheep goat, effect in parapsychology. It's very simple. People who believe that they can do these things are uh, more readily able to actually do them. And we don't have a culture that supports that belief. If, if our culture as a whole were parapsychologically based, would that affect the manifestation of actual phenomena? Well, I would absolutely love to test it out. That is a great idea. And I do believe that, that, uh, that things would be different. We know, for example, that as you just cited, belief is a major variable that associated with being in a conducive, a state conducive to psi. And that fits in with the cases of the big psi performers, like the saints, for example, or the yogis and the shamans. Their belief systems are keyed up intense in a ways that um, the normal person uh, does not have. I mean, ordinary, everyday people say they believe in God, okay? Yeah, I got to believe in God. I go to church, and, and then I leave, and then I go back to life. That's one thing about, that's one way of believing. Then there are the mystics, the, the shamans, uh, the, the, the devoted explorers, who are fanatical about these things. They don't just do it casually or sh in a shallow fashion. 
uh, they invest their whole being, their, their appetites their, are, are molded in accordance with those aims. Their every thought, they're looking at, they're, they're examining their every thought to be sure that it's in tune with the, uh, with their spiritual and it's, it's a totally different kind of animal, uh, that, uh, is, um, responsible for the creation of these high order, uh, supernormal manifestations. But the potential is there for all of us. And, and sometimes by accident, we're thrust into situations where things suddenly manifest that shock and transform us. Well, let's take uh, some of the miracles that uh, we've referred to in our previous discussion about uh, the uh, smiles of the universe, as, as you call them. I'm going to link once again in the upper right-hand corner of your screen uh, to that interview for those of you who haven't watched it. But now, you, you've witnessed statues that weep. And, uh, statues, you, you've reported on statues that actually exude human blood. Uh, how would mind at large, uh, be at play in such an event? I mean, the how, of course, is the part that's hard for us to end. We don't have a, a scientific uh, answer, but the, but the fact is that it takes place. I begin my book with a, a, an example of myself hearing on Channel 4 on the radio about a miracle of a weeping statue in Astoria, Queens, in a Greek Orthodox church. And I went there and uh, observed it myself. I got online and saw the tears or, or liquid-shaped uh, objects coming out of this statue. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I was not the only person that saw this. It was a big lines went on. So the, the, the evidence for these phenomena uh, are, are widespread, and, and I have a chapter in the book uh, listing, pointing out in the 1990s, there seems to have been all over the world uh, an, a virtual epidemic, not a pandemic, but a, an epidemic of, uh, of bleeding and weeping uh, statues of the Madonna and sometimes of Christ, but mainly of the Madonna. For some reason, the Madonna is a figure that in, I believe in some way fascinates the modern spiritual consciousness in a way that uh, you don't see uh, any, co any other corresponding religious figures quite as popular in the, uh, in the mind of believers. And it could simply be because uh, in the Western world, the deity is usually conceived in terms of, of, of a male figure. And uh, the female is neglected. But psychically, I perhaps I would suggest that there is a deep need for a more holistic sense of the of divine power. And, uh, and hence, the figure of the Virgin Mary, uh, at least in the, in the Abrahamic religions, uh, is the only figure that sort of approximates or begins to approximate uh, uh, the elements of, of divine power. And, uh, and that's how and why she's so popular in the, in the imagination of humanity nowadays. There was an article in the geographical, uh, uh, the Na National Geographic magazine recently about the, uh, an image of the Virgin Mary, the most powerful woman in the world, was the headline on, on, the, on that, uh, on that uh, particular issue. So it, it's well known. Not everybody uh, is, seems to be interested, and the scientists, of course, tend to shy away from these things. I don't know what to make of it, but uh, it's there, and it's part of our experience. Well, your suggestion, uh, to me, rings of uh, the Jungian notion of the collective unconscious and the idea that what you're describing as mind at large could be analyzed in terms of uh, archetypes and psychological dynamics uh, uh, as probably best expressed uh, in uh, Jungian thought. I agree, and, and, and that Jung was definitely would be uh, was open and, and sensitive to these possibilities. Uh, I tend to think of the of the archetypes 
uh, as um, somewhat limited in their scope. That mind at large would include, in my judgment, uh, a more active role on the part of, of individuals and a more physically oriented potential, which turns up in many of these miracles. But the psychological part is certainly consistent uh, with the Jungian uh, uh, archetype. And Jung himself, as you know, uh, unlike his predecessor Freud, although Freud too was interested in the paranormal, uh, was I think he wrote Freud, or rather Jung wrote his dissertation on mediumship, uh, and so right from the beginning Jung was open. Uh, but so was Freud. And, and there's a famous remark he made, uh, I don't know if it's true, but I think it's true, that if he had another life to live, he would have devo he would devote it to uh, uh, the study of the paranormal, which I think is pretty cool of, uh, of, of Sigmund. Jung and Freud uh, focus largely on subconscious and unconscious psychological dynamics. Uh, my friend Marty Rosenblatt, I don't know if you know him, but he operates an organization called the Applied Precognition Project, and he works with remote viewers. And he teaches a concept to them very akin to what you're describing as mind at large. He calls it the universe of collective consciousness. So he's talking about the conscious aspects of it. And from the point of view, he has a group of a thousand remote viewers. And basically he's saying to these remote viewers, you know, the, the universe of collective consciousness enables remote viewers to access data from any point in time and space that they choose to go to. Well, I think that's fascinating. I would love to learn about that. And I would add this point. I, I would like to imagine that this, the collective, the harnessing of the collective will could be used for positive purposes. I know there might be a temptation for some to lapse into sorcery and to do nasty things with the, the collective focus. But I don't feel that that's a, that works as well. I, I do feel that the that the will to do good is, is somehow uh, more amenable to the expression of these mysterious latent powers that are within us. And I would certainly like to see, and 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 it does happen when groups of people, for example, pray for uh, for healing. Uh, there are cases on record where. Uh, and they get results. I mean, lots of material uh, to that extent. But uh, and then there may be unconscious group effects, which could be good or bad. We don't know. But to consciously, as you just described, aim to collect large numbers of people and unify their intentions with certain uh, cognitive or, or or healing, let's say, aims. I think is the way to go. And uh, I, 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 I'm very interested and in, I would like to learn more about that from you, uh, your, your colleague. Well, Michael, you've also now proposed that we are all, all of our individual egos are, are linked to this mind at large, but obviously through our own consciousness. Uh, you propose that uh, after death, uh, we survive and could be embedded uh, is the term we've used in mind at large. The next question that it raises is the idea of other non-physical denizens of mind at large, uh, deities, devas, uh, demons, and, and, and so on. Do you have thoughts uh, about that? You, you referred, for example, to the PK man and Ted Owens believed in, in his mind he was working with what he called the space intelligences, hyperspace entities, one might say, or exist within mind at large that uh, did his bidding. I am definitely open uh, to this idea of such beings. And I myself, uh, as, as you know, I've had a number of unusual experiences. And perhaps the most unusual uh, consists of uh, back in 1971, I had just gotten my Ph.D., and I witnessed a UFO with my girlfriend. And then later on, there's another person on the roof who saw the same thing. 
And what it was, it, uh, we were listening to a piece of music by John Coltrane entitled The Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Okay. Uh, and we look out the window and there's this cluster of lights dancing around in unison with the music. It then, I mean, I'm reporting this very quickly. We watch this and then the lights, uh, shot over to the dome of, uh, of Our Lady of Pompeii, a Catholic church, a couple of blocks south or north, no, north of where I was living and perch on top of the dome and beam at us. And then from that position, zigzag motion vanish in an instant over the Empire State Building. Now that I never forgot that experience because there was no, there were three people witnessed it. And that is, it seemed to come, uh, I mean, that was right after I got my PhD in philosophy from Columbia University. I thought the timing was interesting. I took it as a message from the universe. Hey, Mike, you're a doctor now. Doctor in Latin means wise. Figure this one out, you know, <laughs> because I was left with a complete sense of mystery. I still don't have any idea of how to explain that other than to say that, yeah, there's stuff out there. And that uh, every now and then they make they contact us in strange ways. Uh, so yeah, it it does um, the evidence does point to a more interesting multi-dimensional universe, uh, multi-populated universe uh, than we may suspect. Just our own experience as human beings points in that direction. I, I think there's an interesting paradox because uh, on the one hand, uh, it would seem as if by virtue of mind at large, or I sometimes use the phrase, the ground of being, we're all connected. We're all part of one system intimately connected with each other. Uh, on the other hand, uh, William James, for example, wrote this book, uh, uh, A Pluralistic Universe. It's like every individual consciousness is completely unique and, and completely disconnected. It's like uh, uh, no one is the same as anyone else. Right, right, right. I, I'm perfectly happy. We have a little phrase in philosophy, identity and difference. Uh, I mean, it, it it's perfectly consistent to be rooted in one reality, and each of our bodies in time and place and through the culture that we're living our lives out is completely different, and we can revel in those differences while at the same time uh, be sensitive to and honor the commonality of our human reality, the sensus communis that the old uh, uh, Latin uh, uh, writers used to talk about, which we've lost terribly. So I don't want to give up diversity. I want, I want diversity to flourish at the same time with an awareness of our fundamental uh, human identity. And uh, so I don't really see the problem. Uh, in fact, it's, uh, it's rather beautiful. The idea that we should all be the same, you know, because there's one, one mind, it's appalling. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, it's like listening to a piece of music. You don't want to hear one note repeated unless you're Philip Glass. He does it very well, by the way. Uh, but music uh, is constant variation, variations on a theme, right? It's right in music, uh, our moral perspective, so to speak, on this problem. That's how I would view it. Well, you referred to your Catholic upbringing, and uh, it, it strikes me that in Christianity and um, a number of other religions, uh, the the moral universe is sharply divided into good and evil. Uh, and yet, if we're all intimately connected and united through mind at large, it would suggest that everything we call evil is also part of us. Well, yes, but that doesn't mean we have to like it. I mean, uh, we are free agents, and uh, and we do things that definitely uh, we would call evil, and and it is part. I mean, the, the the difference between my concept of mind at large and the traditional idea of God is that mind at large is a a working entity. 
Mind at law, I rather like, uh, Kazan Sarkis wrote a book called The Saviors of God. And the whole gist of it is that God needs us as much as uh, we need God. William James had the same idea. So that I think you can be uh, a kind of theist and accept the evil of this world uh, on the assumption that uh, God is evolving and trying to get us to evolve just as, as, as we are trying to evolve. Now, a lot of the people who want to have a, an absolutistic concept of, uh, of, the, uh, of the divine won't go for that. But uh, it seems to me to fit the facts a little better than, than the other view uh, of the notion of a perfect deity and that anyone who doesn't toe the line of that perfection is immortally screwed. <laughs> I, don't, I don't believe that. I don't believe that at all. Well, Michael Grosso, uh, it's been a fascinating conversation. We could uh, undoubtedly get, talk about mind at large for the next 10,000 years and never get to the bottom of it. It seems like an, a, a subject of infinite depth. Uh, but thank you so much for uh, sharing your perspectives with me. Well, thank you, Jeff. I really enjoyed this talk. And for those of you watching, thank you for being with us.